Good afternoon, international comrades and to our migrant and kababayans. Magandang gabi naman po sa inyo dyan sa Pilipinas. Mapagpalayang pagbati po para sa ating lahat. Welcome back again to the National Democratic Online School. Narito na tayo sa ikasyam na buwan dito sa ND Line Online. So if you have missed any of our episodes, you can check it out sa aming Facebook page, Anak Bayan Europa. We are now on our new episode on which we will tackle the ideas of Chairman Mao Zedong. And today, we will discuss um, one of his works, which is on practice and on contradiction together with where do correct ideas come from. So get your families and friends para sa isa na namang araw ng pagkatuto at diskurso. If you have question to uh, Prof, please just drop it on the chat box or the comment box. And later, after the discussion, we will have a question and answer portion in which Tito Jo can answer your questions. So uh, let's start the discussion again with ILP Chief Emeritus Tito Joma Season. Bihay Tito, mapulang pagbati po para sa inyo. Kamusta po kayo? Uh, Maadap na revolusyonaryong pagbati sa iyo ang kaanghilo sa lahat ng tagapakinig. Uh, ako ay nasa uh, mabuting kalagayan. Uh, kaya naman uh, ako ay makakasakot sa inyong mga tanong. Uh, uh, handa ako sa anumang uh, itatanong ninyo. Uh, ukol sa ating paksa ngayon. I see. 
All right. Tito, let's start na the discussion, no? Um, let's start with the first question, ano? On practice and on contradiction, no? It is written by Mao Zedong in order to expose the subjectivism or errors of dogmatism and empiricism in the party. So, Tito, could you briefly explain the position of the Chinese Communist Party at the time it was written and what kind of errors the party suffered from? Well, uh, the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party um, had to lead the long march uh, from uh, the Chinkang Mountains because of the um, uh, defeat of the uh, side uh, of the people in the fourth and fifth encirclements uh, um, because of the Wang Ming line. Uh, the uh, Wang Ming um, um, took uh, a dogmatist uh, left position and uh, so there were um, uh, there was an overstretch of the armed uh, of, uh, strength of the uh, uh, revolutionary movement uh, they made attacks on far out places and this would leave the uh, people's army uh, in a weak position so the, the long march had to be made along the way um, during the long march, the leadership of Mao Zedong would be uh, affirmed in the Chunyi conference. But even then, as the long march continued, uh, there were those who were too um, uh, empiricist. They thought that going to Yenan uh, was going to uh, an exposed uh, position, which could be subject to attack. Uh, by the Kuomintang forces, so there was a um, the, there was a column that separated, no, to go deeper into the uh, um, uh, areas of the minorities. Uh, anyway, um, the main body of uh, the long marchers reached Yan'an, and in Yan'an uh, there was this uh, um, um, consolidation process involving. Uh, ideological and political study. And in this connection, Mao wrote on practice in 1937 in Yenan, soon after the Long March, and delivered it in a series of lectures on Marxist philosophy. It uh, clarifies its uh, epistemology by explaining the interaction and wave-like advance of social practice and knowledge. It, w it is one of Mao's major philosophical works in which she made a major contribution to the, to the development of dialectical materialism by elaborating on the unity of opposites in social practice. It is a companion piece of another major philosophical work of Mao on contradiction. Having reached Yenan, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party found the opportunity to consolidate its position by promoting theoretical and political education and to prepare for revolutionary struggle, not only against the Kuomintang, but also against the Japanese fascist threat. Mao wrote on contradiction also in 1937. It elaborates on the unity of opposites as the most fundamental law of contradiction and raises to a new and higher development, dialectical materialism. The essay has several sections. The two world outlooks, the universality of contradiction, the particularity of contradiction, the principal contradiction and principal aspect of contradiction, the identity of the struggle of aspects of contradiction, the place of antagonism in contradiction, and finally, the conclusion. I see. All right, Tito, before Marx, no, materialism ex examined the problem of knowledge apart from the social nature of man and apart from his historical development. And so how did Marx change this and how does it mean that people's knowledge depends mainly uh, on their activity in material production? Uh, indeed, the ancient uh, rudimentary materialist in Greece observed natural objects and speculated on their essential composition and changeability, like uh, Democritus and uh, uh, Heraclitus did. But they did not extend their philosophical concern to the, na to the social nature of man. Even in the rise of humanism and science in the period, periods of the Renaissance, 
and the Enlightenment, the mechanical materialists did not extend their philosophical ex concern or theory of knowledge to the social nature of man. At the most, Descartes presumed the existence of God who left the material universe alone to exist autonomously. Together with Engels, Marx formulated the philosophy of dialectical materialism to encompass nature and society, and further formulated historical materialism to concentrate on human society and its stages of development. He focused on the critique of the capitalist mode of production as the foundation, as a material base of the entire capitalist society and its political and cultural superstructure. I see, Pilo. So why is social practice the only criterion of truth? Social practice is the only criterion of truth because it is the only process by which any assertion or proffer of truth on the same basis of some knowledge can be tested, verified, and proven as the truth. Mao teaches us that social practice encompasses production, class struggle, and scientific experiment. And these are the sources of knowledge. Uh, um, the, where do correct ideas come from explain what are these three sources of knowledge? <coughs> there is an interaction of social practice and knowledge, and there is a wave-like advance in this interaction. Raising the level of one leads to raising the level of the other. Tito, what is the process of development of knowledge? At a certain given time, you have a certain level of knowledge through reading and direct investigation, and you apply this knowledge in your practice. This practice leads to a higher level of knowledge, which you can apply to carry out a higher level of practice. And then this higher practice leads to a higher level of knowledge. This goes on indefinitely in a wave-like manner of advancing. It is the process of developing knowledge. Previously, the spiral was a favorite Marxist diagram of the advance of social practice and knowledge. Mao preferred the wave-like advance. I see, Tito. So the perceptual and the rational are qualitatively different, no? So, but are not diverse from each other. They are unified on the basis of practice. So is it possible to gain knowledge with only one way or perception alone or logical alone? And what is the relationship of rational knowledge between perceptual knowledge? The interaction between perceptual knowledge and rational knowledge and their wave-like advance is always necessary for a determined dialectical materialist ever ready to raise the level of knowledge. Otherwise, your knowledge will stagnate and you will fail to understand changes in the situation and make the necessary decision for solving problems and advancing the revolutionary cause. Perceptual knowledge is what you gain by using your senses and personal experience in order to gather the facts in social investigation. This kind of knowledge is necessary for one to start building one's factual base of information, but it is limited and is not the end of knowing. By using class analysis and collective discussions with comrades on a wider range of social investigation, you can arrive at rational knowledge by which you make conclusions, judgments, and formulate tasks. If you limit yourself to perpetual knowledge and do not advance to perceptual knowledge and do not advance to rational knowledge, you are liable to fall into the error of empiricism, limited to narrow, fragmentary, and short-range knowledge. If you limit yourself to rational knowledge and cease to expand your factual or empirical base, you are liable to fall into the error of dogmatism, much given to using jargon and generalizations with outdated and dwindling facts. The errors of empiricism and dogmatism are errors of subjectivism, which are anathema to dialectical materialism. I see, Tito. So practice, knowledge, again practice, and again knowledge. How is this dialectical materialist theory of knowledge significant in the revolutionary task and practices of activists. The wave-like advance of practice, higher knowledge, based on practice, higher knowledge to higher practice, and the dialectical materialist theory of knowledge 
signifies or means the correctness or validity of the revolutionary task and practice of activists and the achievement of revolutionary advances and victories. If you depart from the interaction and wave-like advance of practice and knowledge, you are liable to stagnate and degenerate and cease to do your work well. You know, at every stage you have to be um, prudent, uh, you have to be to act on the basis of what you know as a fax and what you are capable of doing. Uh, if you go beyond um, the limits of uh, uh, the knowledge you have at a given time and, uh, you know, strike out uh, too far from your uh, uh, base of knowledge, you can uh, uh, go wrong. Eh? You can uh, move in the wrong direction or fall into a trap. I see. Tito, let's proceed naman on contradiction. No? Throughout the history of human knowledge, there have been two conceptions concerning the law of development of the universe, the metaphysical conception and the dialectical conception, which form two opposing world outlooks. No? So Tito, could you please explain these two opposing world outlooks? This question presumes that there is a differentiation of the materialist and idealist world outlooks. If you are a materialist, your starting point is matter and the idea follows. If you are an idealist, your starting point is the idea as cause and matter as the result. And you can go so far as to say that the supernatural being created the material universe. But I think your question focuses on the conception of chains as in epistemology or the study of knowledge rather than on the ontology, the study of the nature of things. The metaphysical conception of the world may be the result of an outrightly idealist world outlook or from a mechanical materialist outlook. The former kind of metaphysics is easy to understand, but the latter kind requires a more extended explanation because the mechanical materialists often assert that they are scientific. And some of them, like the followers of imperial criticism and logical positivism, accuse the dialectical materialist of being uh, metaphysical for using generalizations like matter and no, uh, no less, despite Engels' extensive studies of the works in his time in the natural sciences and his effort to integrate these within the framework of dialectical materialism. Mechanical materialists are like frogs in a well who perceive the water and walls of the well and see immediately the sky above when they look up, but they do not see the environment and interconnections of the well. Indeed, in scientific investigation, the natural scientist isolates the object under study and contrasts it from all other objects. Without rejecting the results of scientific investigation done with the metaphysical method of isolating an object under study, the dialectical materialist always takes into account the interconnections and interactions of one object with all other objects. Quite a number of physicists spiritualized the light for a long time. And even after the discovery and development of quantum mechanics, the wave was still spiritualized and idealized to demean and degrade the photon particles, or even at worst, to make the particles disappear, in quotes, disappear. Um, but, and other scientists proved that, in fact, photon as an elementary particle in constant motion with zero mass has its energy transformed into mass when it impacts another particle with the total sum of mass and energy remaining constant throughout the interaction. Thus, photon is matter and energy with the wave as its mode of existence in accordance with the dialectical materialist definition of motion as the mode of existence of matter. I see. Tito, what is meant when Mao speaks of the universality of contradiction? The law of contradiction is universal in the sense that it encompasses and operates in all material objects in nature and society, including the process of cognition and the development of knowledge in the natural and social sciences. Marxist-Leninist, Maoist proletarian revolutionary uh, thinkers and leaders 
had focused on the study of the political economy and class struggle in order to advance the revolution towards socialism and communism. But there are also among them as well as scientists who have uh, focused on the law of contradiction in the various branches of the natural sciences within the framework of the materialist scientific philosophy. It is the aim of the proletariat and its revolutionary party to free science and technology from the clutches of monopoly capitalism and put them in the service of society and nature after so much damage to them by monopoly capitalism. How about the mantito, the particularity of contradiction? We refer to the universality of the law and to the law, the unity of opposites as the most fundamental law of contradiction. This is the biggest generalization that we can make. But there are particular forms of contradictions correspondent to particular forms of matter and to particular fields of uh, uh, study thereof. Um, well, it's, yeah, that's easy to understand uh, in, class, in the study of class society. Uh, class uh, struggle is the, uh, uh, the kind of contradiction you, that you pay attention to. Particular forms of contradictions in particular forms of natural and social phenomena are investigated and unfolded in various fields of study in the natural and social sciences, which are focused on various forms of contradictions. I see. Tito, processes change, uh, old processes and old contradictions disappear. So new processes and new contradiction emerge. And the methods of resolving contradictions differ accordingly, right? So, Tito, can you give a concrete example uh, to describe what Mao meant by this? Revolutionary class struggle is a process to seize political power by armed force from the ruling class in order to emancipate the proletariat and other exploited people in capitalist society. After the proletariat ceases political power, it can build socialism peacefully, handle correctly the contradictions among the people with non-antagonistic methods, and take the steps towards the ultimate aim of communism, even as the socialist state needs to exist for as long as, for as, long as there is the threat from imperialism and reaction from the outside. So Tito, what does it mean and why is it important to understand each aspect of contradiction? It is important to understand each aspect of a contradiction, such as the proletariat as exploited class and the monopoly bourgeoisie as the exploiting class in a capitalist society, so that the proletariat and its revolutionary party would know the balance of strength and know how to conduct the revolutionary class struggle from stage to stage. The more important it is to understand each aspect of a contradiction when there is a complex set of uh, class contradictions in society. We need to recognize the principal and secondary aspects in contradiction. Mm -hmm. The bourgeoisie is the principal aspect and the proletariat is a secondary aspect in a capitalist uh, society we're still holding. In analyzing a complex set of contradictions, we can determine the principal and secondary contradictions. Uh, the, this uh, kind of complex complexity is uh, what you find in <coughs> semi-colonial and semi-feudal societies. In the semi-colonial and semi-feudal social system in the Philippines, <coughs> currently, as in China before the revolutionary victory in 1949, there is a a complex set of exploited <coughs> classes like the big compradors and landlords and exploited the working people like the workers and peasants and uh, there was therefore a complex set of class contradictions involving the national struggle <coughs> against imperialism <coughs> and the democratic struggle against feudalism. Tito, why is it important to pay attention to the stages in the process of development of a thing? Even in a well-developed industrial capitalist country, there can be no immediate uh, big leap from capitalism to socialism just because the forces of production are well-developed and have a social character. The capitalist classes, the state power, and other means to suppress the movement of the proletariat and the people to seize political power. As the Communist Manifesto has long declared, the proletariat must win the battle for democracy before being able to seize political power 
and establish socialism. In a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country like the Philippines, the Filipino proletariat and people need to undergo the stage of people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war as a way of building the revolutionary party of the proletariat, the people's army, the mass movement, the necessary alliance, and the organs of political power constituting the people's democratic power. The people's democratic revolution is basically completed upon the overthrow of the state power of the comprador big bourgeoisie and landlord class. Consequently, the stage of socialist revolution can begin. How do we uh, determine Tito, the principal contradiction? When there is a complex set of contradictions, the principal contradiction is determined according to what is the main enemy in a war situation. Is it a foreign aggressor or is it the reactionary state? If it is a foreign aggressor, all efforts at achieving national unity need to be exerted in order to wage a war of national liberation. If it is the reactionary um, state carrying a war of suppression without full-scale deployment of foreign aggressor troops, the People's Democratic Revolution carries out the protracted People's War as in a civil war. There is a contradiction between the Filipino nation and U.S. imperialism together with other imperialist powers using the local exploiting classes. When an imperialist power unleashes a war of aggression against the Philippines, as Japan did in 1941 to 1945, the Filipino people waged a war of national liberation. U.S. imperialism is always engaged in military intervention, short of full-scale aggression, which becomes highly probable when the People's War reaches the stage of the strategic stalemate, unless the U.S. military power is bowed down elsewhere. When there is yet no war of aggression and the civil war is the sole or main character of the struggle between the exploited and the exploiting classes, the revolutionary party of the proletariat wages protracted people's war on the basis of the worker-peasant alliance in order to encircle the cities from the countryside and accumulate political and armed strength to be able to seize power from the exploiting classes based in the cities ultimately. I see, Tito. All contradictory things are interconnected, interconnected no, Tito. Not only do they coexist in a single in, uh, entity in given conditions, but in other given conditions as well. So they also transform themselves into each other. Tito, can you give an example to explain what Mao meant by this? Like Mao in China, when he was engaged in the People's Democratic Revolution, I have already explained how in the current semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippine society as a single entity, there can be a complex set of contradictions. In the course of the People's Democratic Revolution, the class struggle between the exploited and exploiting classes can take the form of a civil war between the reactionary state and the armed revolutionary movement of the people. If U.S. imperialism unleashes all-out aggression against the Filipino people in order to save the puppet reactionary state, the civil war becomes transformed into a war of national liberation by the Filipino people. If the war of aggression is defeated, it means either the total victory of the people's democratic revolution or, or it still has to carry out a civil war against uh, local reactionary forces. Usually, as in the case of the defeat of, the U of U.S. imperialism in Vietnam, uh, the reactionary classes have no more strength to wage a civil war against the uh, revolutionary forces of the people. Tito, why are the laws of contradictions important to be studied by activists? Uh, the laws of contradiction must be studied by activists so that they can understand the exploiting and exploited classes as contradictory forces in Philippine society. The character of the society and the strategy and tactics to carry out the revolutionary change. Uh, in a revolution, you have to know who are your friends and your enemies. So that's the uh, uh, contradiction you have to handle. With the comparator of big bourgeoisie and the landlord class still ruling and exploiting the toiling masses of workers and peasants, the character of the Philippine society is semi 
feudal and can be changed in a fundamental way by the People's Democratic uh, Revolution through the protracted People's War. And by the way, in carrying out People's War, uh, in applying um, um, a dialectical materialism or uh, um, being able to handle, if you handle the law of contradiction very well, you can understand that even as you start from smaller from a small, with a small and weak army, you can grow into a uh, bigger and stronger army by engaging the enemy in and fighting and taking the weapons from, from him. So there is a transfer of strength from the enemy side to the side of the people. So uh, dialectical materialism gives you that uh, scientific view and method for gaining strength. Uh, uh, you, there is a transference or a transfer of strength from one side to the other. The unity and equilibrium of any society like that of the Philippines is relative and temporary. Within that society, the class struggle between the exploited and exploiting classes is absolute and lasting and enables the exploited class to grow in strength and overthrow the exploiting class and establish a new and fundamentally just and better society is built by the Filipino people. The reactionaries, especially the fascists, are terrified and yet try to belittle the victories and advances of the People's Democratic Revolution in the Philippines, just because this has, this has not yet overthrown the reactionary state based in the cities by more than 50 years of protracted people's war. But the Marcos fascist dictatorship, the pseudo-democratic regimes, and now the Duterte terrorist regime have failed to suppress the armed revolutionary movement. Uh, the, uh, you know, if you recall, uh, during the time of Marcos, uh, the People's Army was very small and very weak. But because precisely of the fascist dictatorship, it was able to grow by winning the support of the people and by winning battles against the enemy. The revolutionary party of the proletariat, the people's army, the revolutionary mass organizations, the National United Front, and the People's Democratic Revolution uh, Movement are nationwide and deeply rooted among the toiling masses now as never before. They continue to grow in strength and advance because they are led by the revolutionary party of the proletariat that correctly applies dialectical materialism in carrying out the people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war. I agree with you, Tito. Anyway, Tito, I think that was the last question no, on our question and answer uh, or on our um, discussion. And right now, we are now opening the floor, the the floor for the question and answer portion. So if you have questions in mind, no, drop it down in the comment box so Tito Jo could answer it, no, could answer it after uh, we go on break. So while we are waiting for your questions to be sent out, we will now proceed to our break time. But before first, uh, here at ND Line Online, we would like to express our um, condemnation against the military and police on the arrest of um, uh, the, uh, the daughter of the recently slain Randall Echanese, who is uh, Amanda Echanese, together with his one-month-old son in, in their homes no, last, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, again, they are victims of the poli police and, mol um, and the military's modus operandi on planting evidences to stop and to to threaten and intimidate activists like Amanda Echanis. Again, we call the military, the military and police the release of Amanda Echanis and uh, his and the, her one month old son. No, for that's why for our break we have two videos from Kodao Productions and Alter Media, which is the plight of political prisoners. This is in honor as well in the International Day of Solidarity with political prisoners. All over the globe, political prisoners have been held in jail for years and even decades for reasons like Trump up tar charges or simply their political affiliations. Some have been basically spent their whole lives in jail and are suffering from lack of access to medical care in their old age, especially in the pandemic. We at ND Line and Anakbayan Europa stand with the cause to free all political prisoners, especially in this healthcare pandemic. Apanorin po natin ang video. Bye. 
ngayon po ay pandahidigang araw ng uh, pakikisa para sa paglaya ng mga pilonggong politikal. Nais po nating mariin na ipanawagan ang kawastuhan kung gaano makaturiran ang panawagang palayain ang lahat ng bilanggong politikal. Wala pong pagtatangi lahat po dahil lahat po sila ay hindi kriminal. Lahat po sila walang ginawang kasalanan. Hinuli at kinulong lang ng gobyerno dahil sa kanilang pampolitikang paninindigan, sa kanilang pagsisilpi sa bayan, sa kanilang mga gawain sa hanay ng mga masa, masang magsasaka, masang manggagawa. Mula nang nagdeklara ng crackdown sa mga aktivista ang Pangulong Rodrigo Duterte, November 2017, ng nakaraang taon, tuliran niyang sinabi na dakpin yung mga nasa legal fronts, di umano, ng uh, NDF. Tuliran niyang sinabi na hindi ko kayo ituturing ng mga aktivista, ituturing ko kayong mga terorista at mga kriminal. Kaya pagdood ng taon, Enero 31, 2018, hinuli po nila at kinuha, binukot ang aking ama, na si Rafael Bailosi, isang peace consultant, sa usapang pangkapayapaan sa pagitan ng gobyerno at ng NDFP. Hindi pa nakakalipas ang isang buwan, binukot naman nila ang aking asawa, si Maug Shimaga. Isang organizer sa hanay ng mga manggagawa. Isang trade union activist ng Kilisang Mayo Uno. At hindi po natapos dyan ang storya ng crackdown ni Duterte. Bob Reyes, illegal na anaresto, Junio 2018. Oliver Ruela Rosales, illegal na inaresto, August 11, 2018. Irineo Atadero, illegal na inaresto, October 15, 2018, kasama ang apat pa sa Santa Cruz 5. At Vicente Nagsad, nito lamang Nobyembre, kasama ang mag-asawang Villamor. Hinuli, meron daw mga paraan sa mga haba ng mga M16, ng mga AK-47. Merong limang daan, apat na pong dahilat, kung bakit tayo naririto ngayon dahil yung mga bilanggong politikal na yan umabot na ng limandaan at apat na po at patuloy pa kaya mga kasama dapat lamang, marapat lamang na dapat natin ipanawagan na ipapura na itong iyak na at sampahan natin kapag mga nakalabas na ang ating mga kamag-anak ang ating mga kasama aktivista yung mga polis na yan yung mga militar na yan dahil hindi sila tumutigil sa mga pagsasampa ng gawagawang aso. Mga kasama, sabay-sabay natin itaas ang ating kamaw at isigaw natin bilang daw politikal Medyo tense ngayon ang atmosphere sa pagitan ng NDFP at GRP papasok sa third round ng peace talks. Noong nagsimula kasi ang usapan na pagkasunduan ang pagpapalaya sa lahat ng political prisoners sa pamamagitan ng amnesty. Pero tila ngayon ay nag-iiba na ang ihip ng hangin. Even now they're asking for the release of 130 political prisoners. Sabi ko, cannot. I cannot give you that. But for the NDFP, tila ginagawang hostage ng GRP ang political prisoners para i-pressure sila sa isang madaliang peace agreement nang hindi naman nilulutas ang roots ng armed conflict. Bakit nga ba ayaw pa silang palayain? Samantalang, maraming political prisoners ang matatanda na at may karamdaman. Last month, pumanaw na nga ang isa sa kanila, si Bernabe Ocasla. Would you believe, nakaposas pa rin ang 66 years old na mamang ito kahit comatose na sa ospital? Biktima lang din ng bulok ng criminal justice system ang mga political prisoners. Meron isinerp sa akin na, na warto pa rin, pero iba yung pangalan. 
araw ng Castillo. Kaya, sabi ko, hindi ako yan. Hindi ko yung ID ko, pero walang walang ginawa ang nabuli sa akin. At hinuli ako noon uh, sa Santiago ng Isabel. Taliwas sa news reports, hindi lahat sa kanila ay rebelde. Gawagawa lang ang karamihan ng ebidensya at kaso laban sa kanila. Priambulo ng uh, karil. Isang halimbawa ang dating political prisoner na si Voltaire Guray. Dahil walang mahuling NPA kung saan siya naroroon, siya ang dinakip at pinagbintangang rebelde ng militar. Tubong Rizal si Voltaire at nooy nakikipamuhay lamang sa mga katutubong dumagat na tinutulungan niya sa kanilang oposisyon sa Laiban Dam. Gustong palubugin, gustong tayuan ng dam. Sa itin barangay yung palulubugin nila, doon maraming katutubo at mga magsasaka ang maaalis doon sa lugar nila. Kitang-kita ko na matindi yung pagsasamantala sa mga katutubo at magsasaka. Sinasamantala sila dahil sa kakulangan nila sa edukasyon. Yung mga ganong uh, kalagayan na, na mga magsasaka at katutubo, ang itinutulungan namin sila doon na ipaglaban yung kanilang karapatan. Isang araw, dumating ang mga sundalo sa kanilang pamayanan. Natutulog ako sa isang bahay ng magsasaka at sinabi sa akin nung may-ari ng bahay na marami daw sundalo sa paligid, may presensya daw ng uh, NPA doon sa lugar at dahil wala naman silang nahuli, ako yung hinuli nila. Tinalian ako sa kamay at piniringan ako, uh, sinakay ako sa motor, Uh, Kitang-kita yun ng taong baryo dahil alam naman nila kung ano yung ginagawa ko doon. Uh, dinala ako sa detachment na malapit doon sa, e sa area na yun. Ilang araw siyang inkomunikado o walang komunikasyon sa mga mahal sa buhay, pati na rin sa abogado, habang iniinterrogate sa loob ng kampo. Tuloy-tuloy yung interrogation nila sa akin nung panahon na yun. Habang nakapiling ako, kinakasahan ako ng mga baril sa paligid ko at uh, Sinasabi nila na nahukay na daw yung paglilibingan ko. Saka lamang siya dinala sa kulungan at sinampahan ng umanoy gawa-gawang kaso. Pagmamayari ko daw yung explosive na hawak ko daw yung granada ko ayon sa testimony ng mga sundalo. Pero ang totoo, wala naman akong dalang explosive at sinamahan pa nila ng pitong bala. Kuya, ano pa yung mga naging karanasan mo sa loob? Uh, sa loob ng kulungan, dahil napakalimitado lang yung galaw mo, kailangan mo talagang libangin yung sarili mo eh. Napakabigat sa loob, lalo pat alam mo rin na yung mga kaso sa iyo ay mga gawagawang kaso. At kailangan uh, magpakatatag dahil alam mong lalaya ka dahil hindi totoo yung mga kinakaso sa iyo. Matapos makulong ng apat na mahabang taon, nakapagpiyansa rin si Voltaire. Ayon sa korte, mahina ang kaso laban sa kanya. Sa panahong inilagi niya sa loob ng jail, maraming obrang sining ang nilikha ni Voltaire para ipakita ang kalagayan at paninindigan ng daan-daan pang katulad niya. Isa sa mga ina-address ng peace talks ay ang injustice sa ating bansa. At isang injustice ang patuloy na pagkakakulong sa mga freedom fighters. Hindi ba tama lang na palayain natin sila? Uh, sorry about that. Welcome, welcome back again to the National Democratic Online School. Currently, we are discussing uh, Mao Zedong's on practice and contradictions. Also, where do correct ideas come from? We are now on our question and answer portion. So if you have questions in mind, just drop it on the comment box so Tito Jo could answer it for you. Tito, uh, there are several questions that have been sent already to us from our audiences. The first one would be, the National Democratic Movement has had different kinds of relationships with the Duterte regime in the course of his term. Could you explain changes in the relationship with him using the theory of dialectical materialism in order for us to have more concrete examples of dialectical materialism in practice? 
Uh, we must understand the uh, social character of Duterte as a politician um, in order to uh, understand how the National Democratic Movement uh, uh, in southern Mindanao um, uh, regarded him as an ally. And even the uh, armed uh, revolutionary movement in particular treated him uh, as an ally. But what kind of ally is Duterte? Well, the, the southern, um, the revolutionaries in southern Mindanao had always regarded Duterte as a bureaucrat capitalist. In his capacity as mayor, he was always regarded as a bureaucrat capitalist. And in that sense, he is uh, uh, a political agent uh, of the, uh, of the, um, uh, uh, the big bourgeoisie, the comprador bourgeoisie of Dabao and um, the landlord class. He himself uh, has the character of a landlord. He has land holdings and he has some certain commercial interest. So um, he's dealt with as a bureaucrat capitalist who has contradictions with his fellow um, bureaucrat capitalists. He was never regarded as representative of the um, um, any of the basic uh, um, uh, classes in the basic alliance of workers and peasants, or he was never regarded as a middle, eh? as a representative of the any of the middle forces. He was regarded as a uh, friendly part, a temporary and unstable ally from the ranks of the reactionaries. So uh, that must be understood. So um, in um, uh, Southern Mindanao, that has been his uh, standing. But of course, he likes to present himself as more than that, no? And once, uh, mm -hmm. once upon a time, uh, he, he was even volunteering to become a consultant of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines in peace negotiations with the um, Philippine reactionary government. And he would say, long live the, uh, he would shout every time he would go to the uh, guerrilla front, he would shout, long live the Communist Party of the Philippines and, um, and uh, uh, long live the New People's Army. And all these uh, uh, servants of his in uh, the National Task Force, ELCAC, and, um, um, and uh, the so-called Anti-Terrorism Council, um, they, they are not calling, uh, they're not making him account no? for his um, uh, being with the Reds, no? Mm. Uh, and anyway, <laughs> that is a, uh, that is a, uh, uh, a comment on the side. Now, with regard to Duterte's aiming for the presidency, definitely the Communist Party of the Philippines did not support him uh, because he himself... Uh, had this tactic of pretending not to be interested in the position. Remember, he was late in filing his uh, candidacy. And so, um, but anyway, as a matter of principle and policy, the Communist Party does not participate in the, the, the bourgeois elections conducted by the reactionary government. It, it never does that. And um, uh, so uh, there was no occasion for the Communist Party um, to express support for Duterte as a, can, a candidate. Uh, there may be circumstances that would uh, make it appear that he enjoys the support of the Communist Party. Um, if, if only to encourage that Duterte, that in case he becomes president, he would continue to at least behave as he had behaved, as a bureaucrat capitalist. He would show friendliness, openness to peace negotiations. And he was uh, promising the release of all of, uh, political prisoners. And uh, uh, he was promising to uh, uh, have peace negotiations in order <laughs> to solve, to address the roots of the armed conflict. So uh, when a politician talks that way, you don't say you're crazy or you're just pretending. Uh, we ignore you. We oppose you as a liar. No, you cannot say that. Immediately, so there was the there is the appearance of uh, uh, his being able to get the support of the Communist Party, but he was never supported by the Communist Party. The Communist Party, as far as I can see, always regarded him with um, uh, uh, 
with a great deal, with tons of salt, with a great deal of uh, doubt. <coughs> it was um, Duterte uh, who had the burden of proving, but the Communist Party, uh, out of political prudence, will not just say, oh, Duterte, you are lying, you're pretending now, we, we can read your mind now, no. And that's never done uh, by any politically responsible entity. So, um, he got to be president by his own wits and by his own ways. He became president because he was able to get the support of the most rotten um, political forces in the Philippines, the Marcoses um, in Ilocos Norte, uh, uh, Arroyo, the former yeah. president, Estrada. He gave the credit to him as a bourgeois politician. He was able to get. It's not the Communist Party that made him president, contrary to claims of the Trotskyites and other anti-communist uh, uh, forces. Now, um, you know, in dealing with a uh, with a, um, a, a bourgeois personality, you know, if you remember, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, was able to train in the Soviet Union uh, because, because he was able to ingratiate himself with Sun Yat-sen at the time that the Kuomintang and the Communist Party were united. Yeah. Um, and um, he, uh, Chiang Kai-shek was a runner boy, errand boy of a um, um, big uh, uh, criminal, the leader of a big criminal syndicate. And uh, then he uh, turned political. He ingratiated himself with Sun Yat-sen. He was able to uh, uh, become a, uh, a leader and he, he trained as a a military man in the Soviet military academy. Uh, but it, he would uh, imagine, and uh, uh, once upon a time would say, if you will kill any communist, it would be like killing me myself. Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, bourgeois politicians can pretend like that. So can Duterte. And uh, of course, there is the process of unfolding. Um, the, the lying character has to uh, expose himself through his actions over time. Uh, no communist party can claim to have a crystal ball or uh, uh, present itself as a mind reader. No, only Trotsky eyes can claim that kind of uh, um, uh, unscientific ability uh, to determine the character of something that is still in the process of developing. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Duterte exposed himself as a liar. Eventually, shortly after becoming president, uh, the first time he visited a military camp, he was already saying, oh, it's different now. I'm now president. I represent the entire country, not only Davao. Uh, and I'm going to use this. Uh, I'm going to behave as the, your commander in chief and I will um, do everything to defeat the insurgency. He, he was already talking that way quite differently when he was still not president. So he began exposing himself uh, soon after becoming president. And um, actually the peace negotiations were delayed because he could not deliver um, uh, honest promise to release all political prisoners. Uh, in fact, there was the June exploratory meeting of 2016 um, to make, to pave the way for the first formal talks in August. And uh, it was obvious then that uh, he was hedging. He was turning, uh, uh, turning uh, his back on his, on his promise. And so uh, the communist, the, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines was already suspicious of the Duterte as a liar, as someone who cannot deliver on his promise even then. And uh, so um, it did not take long uh, for the for Duterte to expose himself as having no interest in peace negotiations. Um, as early as uh, uh, May 2017, uh, he wanted to, uh, he, he targeted the uh, uh, NPA and the CPP in Mindanao uh, by covering it, by covering them with the proclamation supposedly against terrorism. And uh, much earlier than that, surreptitiously, he um, um, he declared an all-out war policy in a very uh, in a very 
uh, tricky way. Um, he allowed his uh, uh, military forces to continue, supposedly continue, Oplan Bayanihan of Aquino. So that was a cowardly way uh, of separating himself from the uh, um, continuing military campaign uh, against the revolutionary movement. He made it appear this is a continuance of Aquino's policy. And um, so you have a tricky liar and a gangster uh, in Duterte. That's, and he has proven himself absolutely that he is one. And um, it is in the application, you know, in the course of the peace negotiations, all tricks were done eh, to, in order to make the um, revolutionary movement capitulate. Um, but the NDF was able to stand up and uh, rebuff uh, such attempts, such as, you know, asking for uh, the people's government to cease functioning uh, by, suppose, by by giving up uh, uh, vital governmental functions, and by um, um, uh, it, uh, the, the GRP side was proposing uh, protracted um, indefinite ceasefire in exchange for the release uh, of political prisoners by installment. No, so all those tricks were tried, but uh, uh, the GRP, uh, um, thanks to the wisdom. Uh, and political prudence of the G NDFP negotiators, the GRP did not have its way uh, uh, to fool, uh, to hoodwink um, um, uh, its way uh, towards the capitulation of the revolutionary movement. So dialectical materialism was uh, was applied. No, you cannot uh, uh, act and speak properly without watching your opponent how it be how he behaves. Um, you cannot, uh, in peace negotiations, as in war, you cannot just do something uh, that is not justified eh, by the facts and by the actual behavior of your opponent across the table or uh, across the battlefield. I see. Tito, there is another question, no, Vincent? Could you give ex, uh, could you please explain antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions and uh, can a contradiction change from antagonistic to non-antagonistic and vice versa? Uh, you see, uh, in the case of Duterte, you will see here that uh, um, as a reactionary politician, as a bureaucrat capitalist, he is what you might call an uh, unreliable uh, and temporary ally. He, on, on certain terms, he can be your ally, but he, he is the type that uh, easily flips uh, from be, being a, an ally to a brutal enemy. When the, when the reactionary is uh, being, um, um, uh, is, is on the downside, with regard to the ruling clique, uh, he can be friendly to the uh, revolutionary movement out of necessity. And you have to be, you have to know that as a revolutionary, you have to know that, that um, he is friendly because of his self-interest. But the moment he, that reactionary becomes, comes to power, he can be as bad, eh? uh, brutal and corrupt as the, um, as the previous uh, ruler. So that, that's where uh, non-antagonistic becomes uh, antagonistic. So uh, for a long while, as uh, Dabo City Mayor Duterte was non-antagonistic, he was an ally, uh, a reactionary, and um, uh, an unreliable temporary ally. Mm -hmm. But when he uh, got power to himself, all the opportunity to steal, uh, um, to increase his power, um, in a, uh, a in an almost unlimited way, and uh, uh, to steal uh, from the public coffers and do all sorts of corruption, uh, he would be uh, uh, he would draw away from his previous non antagonistic position, and that's also the case in handling with the middle bourgeoisie or the national bourgeoisie in the middle um, uh, section of the political spectrum. I don't know this. Uh, Trotsky, I'd say, uh, the, uh, the line of People's Democratic Revolution is a line of 
of subordination to the national bourgeoisie. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, but anyway, the middle, uh, the middle bourgeoisie is very weak in the Philippines. The national bourgeoisie is very weak. And the Trotskites are stupid to um, uh, put the label of national bourgeois to Marcos or Duterte. No, um, Duterte and Marcos are what you call the big comprador, uh, landlord, uh, uh, capitalist type of politician. And they represent uh, uh, not the um, national bourgeoisie with ambitions of industrializing the Philippines and becoming the ruling bourgeoisie. So the, the national bourgeoisie in the Philippines has become weak, but given the chance um, with a political leadership that can pose as a nationalist force wanting to industrialize the country, uh, that's a, uh, it's possible for the national bourgeois uh, to, you know, be a dangerous um, uh, opponent of the revolutionary movement. It can flip eh, from being a, an, uh, an ad ally in the middle section of the political spectrum into an enemy. But that's a far away possibility at the moment. They, they remain, um, as a matter of fact, it's more of uh, uh, supporting their ambition rather than the reality. Eh? Their ambition to become big industrial bourgeoisie uh, is uh, uh, being supported, but uh, the reality is uh, far from that. So uh, in uh, certain um, countries where the national bourgeoisie is strong because the president takes the position, uh, the ruling party uh, takes, the, takes up the, the ambition of the national bourgeoisie, it can be dangerous. Uh, for instance, in, um, in Iraq, uh, uh, Saddam used to uh, uh, express national bourgeois ideas and the imperialist powers made it a point to uh, bring him down. Huh? The US and the British imperialists made it at a point uh, to uh, destroy someone who represents that kind. And, but uh, so um, the Saddam would maintain um, a relationship in so far as uh, the Soviet Union was still existing and supporting the revisionist Communist Party of Iraq. So the uh, Saddam played ball with the revisionist Iraqi Communist Party. Uh, that's, but that kind of... Uh, that kind of thing is not existent in the Philippines. The national bourgeois is very weak in the Philippines. Uh, right now, uh, uh, there is no one in the in the Philippine Senate, uh, no senator now exists who expresses the views of the national bourgeoisie. Uh, in the time, in previous times, there were um, outstanding senators who spoke uh, on an anti-imperialist uh, plank and who took the, um, the position of the national bourgeoisie, like the rectos and pañadas, no? Mm -hmm. That time is past. The national bourgeoisie has, uh, has weakened even more uh, uh, after the, as a result of neoliberalism and so on and so forth. So um, uh, uh, that's the case for the national bourgeoisie. But the, uh, it's enough that I, I explain with plenty of time when, let's say, do we discuss on the correct handling of contradictions in socialist society, how to handle um, uh, antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions, but uh, it's good to understand also uh, these, um, um, uh, the characteristics of antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions, even while uh, the people are still engaged in the People's Democratic Revolution. I see. Tito, for the third question from our audience, no? is there only one correct idea or truth? Or what do you think of postmodernistic post philosophy that each individual has their own reality and truth? Uh, this is a big question, and uh, I will try to answer it uh, uh, in a very comprehensive way. Um, there's no way, uh, it's, for instance, the question is there one correct idea or truth? Well, that brings up uh, the question is, uh, what is our world outlook? Uh, 
uh, how do we regard the nature of uh, uh, reality? So um, we, the dialectical materialists, uh, stand for uh, the materialist scientific viewpoint. No? We regard uh, uh, the whole universe, uh, that means to say nature and society, as consisting of uh, a material reality. We, we don't deal phantoms and ideas and phantoms are created by by uh, uh, the imagination of human beings, no? And uh, as regards to the uh, to the nature of reality, uh, well, uh, uh, they have their materiality with um, and uh, they, cons they are constituted by uh, uh, unities of opposites. <laughs> <laughs> contradictions. So that differentiates us from, you know, the differentiation between materialism and idealism. We start from reality, uh, uh, hard reality, and from then on we move towards uh, um, uh, ideas uh, uh, about such reality. But when you start, your starting point is is the idea of you and you think that uh, matter is merely a reflection of um, of the idea that's platonic, no? And uh, that is baliktad, no? Or if you are Hegelian, uh, development of things is the realization of the prior development of ideas. Uh, and that is idealism. We don't uh, take that, no? Mm. So that's clear where, where we stand philosophically. Now, now this. Uh, now let us consider uh, the history of civilization. Um, it is uh, um, the convention to divide history that mankind has so far experienced in what is called civilization, as differentiated from primitive commun communal life, which existed, which had existed for hundreds or even millions of years, and. Um, uh, when you speak of civilization, uh, that means to have that means having societies uh, uh, away that have drawn away from the Stone Age. That's one expression you can go by, and you move into the period of uh, the uh, 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 emergence of uh, classes and class struggle, m uh, development of. Uh, metallurgy, eh? no longer stones, and you have literacy and all the higher levels of knowledge. Uh, that is civilization. And um, and in this long history of civilization, and that's uh, you have a big division between the ancient eh? and the modern. And in the ancient, you have the slave type of society and the feudal type of society. And uh, in the, the um, uh, thereafter, you have the modern period, the period uh, uh, marked by the Renaissance. Renaissance in European history uh, signifies the affirmation of humanism uh, as against divinism, uh, especially uh, in contrast to the preceding feudal culture which uh, uh, ascribes to a supernatural being, God, no? as the cause and source of everything. Um, this time in the Renaissance, there is, a, uh, there is a, uh, a change of focus to man as the doer of things. So you have humanism, man responsible for himself. No? Mm -hmm. And then uh, this would mark also the rise of science and technology. Huh? Uh, we are now speaking of the 16th century uh, with the elements of science and technology uh, advancing even to promote production. Then uh, this is the modern period. And um, in uh, political terms, when the French Revolution came, when the Enlightenment and the Revolution came, um, there was already a struggle of uh, of, uh, of the people for political equality. And even the bur rising bourgeoisie made use of this as a um, basis for putting, for, for uh, coming on top of the uh, feudal aristocracy and the absolute monarchies. So the French Enlightenment 
uh, brought out brought up uh, the liberal uh, philosophy now and then uh, eventually um, deep into the industrial revolution you have the rise of marxism on the basis of the growth of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie um, now coming to the 20th century after the victories of uh, um, socialism in a number of countries and uh, with the existence of communist parties in the West, especially in France, you have all those all kinds of subjectivism. And um, uh, I think uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre started the deviations, subjective deviations from Marxism. Even as he belonged to the Communist Party of France, he overstressed the subjective. No? Mm -hmm. He said, uh, you know, he sweepingly said that the Communist Party is all concerned about essence, definition um, of the essence. He is for existence. Eh? And so um, he, um, he adopted existentialism. He developed it and he, he had uh, all sorts of fellow authorities on the, on the subject of subjectivism. You know, uh, thinking forces are called by Marxist subjectivism forces like the Communist Party of the Philippines, uh, all uh, uh, thinking forces are subjective, but subjectivist uh, or uh, doing subjectivism, being a subjectivist is another thing from being conscious and subjective. It is uh, overstressing the subjectivist. But anyway, uh, came the uh, Althusser, Althusser, uh, uh, he was some kind of a psychological case anyway. He killed his wife, no? Um, and uh, at the age of 80, by suffocating him with his pillow. Um, but anyway, he, he, he was the first one to uh, stress uh, the, the important of, importance of psychology. And um, anyway, he, um, he repeated the old charge against uh, 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 Marxism and material, dialectical materialism as, uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing everything to uh, uh, economics. So economic reductionism, uh, that was another expression for determinism, economic determinism. He just uh, made use of, syn of a, made use of a syn synonym. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, the, this is a departure from the uh, more uh, rational and more truthful structure in the thinking of Marxists. Uh, Marxists, in the tradition of Marx and Engels and all dialectical materialists, would assume that a society can exist uh, because it produces, it engages in production, all kinds of societies, primitive, uh, or uh, civilized society, um, there has to be production. So uh, the economic, uh, the mode of production or the economic uh, base uh, has to be the material base of a society. No society exists without that uh, um, basis. And then on top of it, as civilization develops, you have the development of politics and uh, culture in the uh, superstructure, uh, politics would involve having the state as the highest formation, political formation in culture. A culture may uh, have uh, all kinds of influences from the past and from uh, all kinds of speculations. But there is also, you know, um, development of uh, scientific knowledge. And um, that's... Uh, um, from the rudimentary and to higher levels of scientific knowledge. So that's the structure we know. And then you have the base, the material base in the mode of production, and in the superstructure you have the politics and, uh, and culture. So what do these, uh, as the subjectivism grew worse in France, you know, I call the philosophers in France who are subjectivists and so-called uh, postmodernists as uh, 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 what do you call that in the market? Uh, uh, you get uh, 
uh, in France usually he become recognized as a philosopher, uh, even if you just write something as long as a column in a newspaper, you can project yourself as a science, as a philosopher. But anyway, you have Foucault, huh? Foucault, a, a much crazier guy. And uh, they go into, you know, the mode of thinking and uh, in separation of, uh, uh, of material objects of study. And um, so they make use of uh, uh, linguistics and psychiatry even. Psychiatry is the worst uh, uh, over-focus. Uh, the, the worst over-focus they do is on psychiatry. Uh, they, they focus on the, uh, on the behavior, on the psychiatric behavior uh, or psychological behavior of people. So you have this, and you have some people who try to have a, a, a mix of even Maoism and, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychiatric or psychological desire, uh, which is over-elaborated, as in uh, Alain, uh, Alain Badiou. No? So uh, you have all these uh, um, um, uh, postmodernists, so-called, in, in France. Um, they are, uh, 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 what do you call A dime a dozen. They, they, these are... Uh, uh, these, these are what I call trivialist, uh, uh, these uh, postmodernist philosophers, and they don't succeed in overturning dialectical materialism, even when they express uh, um, origins or sympathies, origins from or sympathies with um, Marxism. Um, and of course, uh, you don't just have the postmodernist. Uh, uh, I usually call these uh, uh, cheap philosophers as posterior philosophers, no? Um, and but there are other centers of uh, of subjectivist thinking. Uh, you have the Frankfurt School, that's another strain. You have the um, Austrian, and of course, uh, in in London, in England, you have uh, uh, all sorts of empiricistic ideas, yes. and uh, it. Uh, the UK has long been uh, uh, a base for uh, uh, thinking that opposes uh, uh, Marxism, Leninism. So I, I think um, uh, these philosophies reflect uh, a certain part of reality, uh, which is the subjectivist uh, thinking of people who, who um, who think uh, um, inaccurately about social realities and who uh, exaggerate certain parts of uh, reality. They overemphasize the uh, realm of uh, uh, the mode of thinking, uh, but of course, uh, knowing, understanding modes of thinking are important uh, uh, insofar as understanding for, what material material basis do they come from? Uh, uh, do they have? No. Yes. So these subjectivists are usually uh, the mode of thinking of the petty bourgeois, um, who uh, who is in a deep well and who do who do not recognize the reality of um, um, uh, the forces of production and uh, the character of uh, uh, the relations of production. And they uh, 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 they indulge in themselves as uh, in their own consciousness about things um, that are more important, far more important than the narrow-minded and short-sighted thinking of the petty bourgeois. I see. All right, Tito. Before we proceed to the fourth question, no, I would just like. To plug into our audiences, um, the foreign language press. So basically, uh, we have a, a press um, group no, that is uh, creating books of revolutionary ideas as well as um, for uh, revolutionaries. Ano? So basically, uh, you could, if you want, or if you want to have books or if you want to buy a books, no, especially this coming Christmas, na it is really useful to give someone a book no we there is uh, you could visit flpress.store.nv.com 
on the on that website on that uh, online shop you could find books for example communist manifesto um we have their um uh, selected works of Mao Zedong from volume 1 to 9. Uh, we have their uh, The State and Revolution. Uh, there's also works no, on other um, countries for like India and others. And it is really great no, no, if you could visit uh, ffpress.storenv.com so you could know the selections and the, the, the books that they have there. Um, it's really cheap. It, it costs like from $6 up to $10. No, and uh, it's really great to gift it for someone this coming Christmas. No, so if you want to have one, no, just visit flpress.storenv.com. No, just visit that website and you'll have a great selection. No, Tito, um, let's go back no, to our question and answer. Na naman. No, we have questions from Tandang Eric. He says, In April 2020, you wrote. A comment on dialectical materialism, idealism, and mechanical materialism, where you ended with, dialectical materialists always seek to learn from the laws of natural science in order to shed light on the materiality of the objective conditions and subjective factors interacting in social reality and social transformation. And in the realm of social science, they learn best and most from the impact and consequences of the advances in science and technology to society. But they never seek to replace with any notion of dialectical materialism in any scientific law or process discovered and proven in the process of scientific experiment or technological invasion. What prompted you to write this and emphasize this point? Are there certain scientific advancement that seems to contradict with dialectical materialism? Well, I simply mean that the laws of natural science discovered by scientists and further developed, um, developed in technology only prove the material, materiality of the objective conditions, even if sometimes uh, certain scientists are idealist or uh, logical positivist and are opposed to, mar to dialectical mm -hmm. uh, materialism or Marxist philosophy. Uh, but the point is... Uh, um, you cannot arrive at the laws of natural uh, uh, science if you do not follow what the empiricist, uh, empiricist uh, John Locke said, that uh, yeah. um, you have to have material, uh, you have to have the material object eh, as the object of study. Eh? It proves that uh, when you have laws of natural science developed, you have studied uh, uh, material uh, uh, the pertinent material things. Um, now, um, um, dialectical materialists do not impose uh, their, uh, their laws of contradiction uh, as explaining everything. Uh, the laws of contradictions are uh, mere generality, uh, a mere generalization of so many things and cannot um, uh, be used to uh, do away or to degrade, or to demean, or uh, let's say um, uh, consider as, uh, as um, uh, useless uh, scientific experiments and scientific discoveries, because as I pointed out, there are all sorts of contradictions uh, in um, different forms of matter and in society and nature. And it's wrong to say that uh, uh, the laws of contradictions is already clarified in the most general way by um, um, uh, Marx, uh, Engels, Lenin, down to Mao, uh, uh, would, be, would be sufficient to explain. You don't stop a scientific experiment. They say, oh, uh, uh, Engels has already explained what the Engels, um, Engels studies in the natural sciences uh, were, were in accordance with the uh, discoveries, scientific discoveries existent in his own time. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, natural science makes generalizations too. For instance, the conservation of uh, matter and energy you can only transform them, you cannot totally destroy them, no? So, uh, uh, 
that is a generalization, but that's not that kind of generalization does not explain everything huh? uh, or does not prevent scientists from uh, studying further all sorts of material things because uh, uh, you have the different behaviors of uh, 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 things and uh, uh, you have uh, particularities in the operation of general laws. Uh, so, and uh, also, um, while it is good to study the natural sciences in order to uh, find uh, uh, the validity uh, of, a of a universal law, of the law of contradiction as a universal law, um, you, it, uh, you can only uh, get some light, no? But that light does not replace your own understanding of society. Uh, social sciences uh, have their uh, uh, are distinguishable from the natural sciences, and in the sciences, uh, the science of making revolution is a very particular thing. Uh, there are particular contradictions there which you have to get into. Uh, and, uh, you know, knowing the laws of contradiction in all kinds of uh, uh, disciplines would not be enough. Uh, if you do not concentrate on the laws operating in uh, the People's Democratic Revolution or the People's War, for instance. So um, there may be generalities that are valid, but you really have to go into the particularity of a contradiction in a particular natural or social phenomenon in order really to understand eh? uh, how the law of contradiction operates, uh, where it uh, operates most concretely. Um, you know, uh, uh, you cannot solve the problem of COVID-19 eh, by adopting some general principle from all the previous studies about coronaviruses. You have to um, study COVID-19 as a particular uh, coronavirus in order to in order to lick it, to I mean to say, in order to beat it. No, uh, that's what I mean. No. Um, so, and uh, uh, the main point is uh, uh, when you are confronted with a particular problem, um, you must take as a materialist. And a uh, materialist, uh, someone with materialist scientific view, you have to understand what is the particular law of contradiction operating in the thing. Uh, that's all what I mean. And uh, no generality, uh, no law of contradiction, uh, uh, no matter how universal uh, and how general it is, cannot, uh, uh, cannot best be a guide. No? It gives you uh, the guidance uh, that uh, uh, all things that are problematic are solvable if they are real problems. Uh, unreal problems, like a, a person going crazy, well, that's something for the psychiatrist, no? And, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so in, in other words, a problem to be treated in a very realistic way can only be dealt with when you understand uh, the concrete law of contradiction operating in the concrete thing. Mm -hmm. I see. All right, Tito, um, I think this is already for our last question. Ano? Uh, could dialectical materialism be misused or utilized by reactionary forces? Oh, yes, any kind of correct philosophy, any kind of correct... Uh, a set of thinking can be um, can be abused, no? Can be misused or misinterpreted. So there are what I call the infantile uh, Maoist. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, uh, they say uh, uh, Gonzaloism is the realization. Uh, uh, they have this side. Uh, they are Maoist, uh, and they are especially. Gonzaloite, because Gonzaloite um, uh, completed the process of making Mao, Maoism as the 
third highest development. They're crazy. Uh, Mao himself uh, did his best and in his own time, his uh, uh, level of developing Marxism-Leninism was already uh, well formulated. And then they want to universalize protracted people's war, uh, even in the industrial capitalist countries. And I can tell them uh, the history of uh, what amounted to uh, people's war for a long time in Europe. And I, you know the, you know the, all the, and I can present to you in general terms how it developed. You know how the Roman Empire was uh, beaten? It was beaten after centuries of resistance by the Germanic tribes, okay? Um, and um, uh, over the period that Charlemagne became the Christian hero who preserved uh, Christianity, uh, especially with Rome, uh, after Rome adopted yeah? Christianity as its official religion in the third um, uh, century uh, AD. And, uh, um, uh, and then the Germanic tribes would, uh, well, uh, Charlemagne was a hero against the, uh, against the Mongol uh, tribes invading Europe. And uh, the, uh, the Mongol tribes, um, especially after adopting Islam, um, became a powerful force, especially in the Slavic countries. And but uh, here in Central Europe and in most of uh, Western Europe, you would have the Germanic tribes playing the, uh, 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 a major role in opposing um, uh, the Roman Empire. Some of them were uh, uh, Romanized, but uh, in the main, the Germanic tribes uh, kept their ground. Uh, they gave a beating to the, uh, to the Roman Empire as early as 9 AD. And by the time that uh, the, the Roman Empire was already in a state of collapse, uh, the Germanic tribes eventually would uh, even be the ones to put up the Holy Roman Empire, no? Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the barbaric uh, uh, tribes uh, uh, confederated, eventually uh, making the feudal states in uh, Europe. Uh, and from the 10th century onwards, the Germans would uh, be a uh, dominant power in mainland Europe. And, uh, you know, the fight conducted by the Germanic tribes would amount to, you know, people's war uh, against the uh, better organized Roman Empire with more irons in their hands. Now, um, the next development would be in the, in the wars that followed. Uh, armies were um, uh, the best example of people's war, you might say, or guerrilla warfare would be how the Grand Army of Napoleon was beaten. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, it was beaten. Uh, why? Because the Spanish adopted the guerrilla warfare. That's why the name, uh, the term guerrilla comes from Spanish. So uh, the Grand Army, uh, uh, a part of the Grand Army was destroyed. And then Napoleon made the mistake of invading uh, Russia. And you got the partisan warfare, the guerrilla warfare of the Russians. So after uh, Napoleon made these two mistakes of, in, of invading Spain and uh, Russia, two-thirds of his army, so that when he was already in Waterloo, he had only one-third of his former Grand Army, and um, he thought he could handle the British. He did not know that the Prussian army was in the forest uh, uh, laying ambush. But anyway, uh, they, those are the big uh, demonstrations of uh, people's war, with inferior weapons eventually uh, beating eh, the, uh, the most organized, the best armed army. And uh, uh, of course, in World War II, we also, World War I and World War II, we still saw the importance of the partisan warfare is still being made to, um, uh, uh, maybe in the uh, uh, partisan warfare, uh, including warfare from the countryside, would play a role, especially in the less developed parts of Europe. Uh, but so much for uh, that short, you know, 
Uh, now let us take this. Uh, let let us take up these uh, infantile Maoists. They have been uh, advocating protracted people's war or people's war in general for so long already, at least more than two or three decades. When did they start? In any industrial capitalist country, they haven't uh, started. I uh, started it anywhere. And let us say, fo let's focus on Norway. How can the infantile Maoists there? You know, the peasants now in Western Europe are rich peasants who have tractors, and they they represent only two percent of the population. So it's uh, so much different from the peasantry of China in the past or the Philippines at present. Well, the peasantry in the Philippines, as it was the case in China, composed the majority of the people. Now you have two percent rich peasants. Uh, with tractors, with college degrees, you know, you cannot be, you cannot be a peasant, a farmer, you cannot be a farmer in Norway without, um, or in any of the Scandinavian countries without a college degree in agricultural science. <laughs> That's quite different from the poor peasants uh, in uh, in uh, China of the past of the Philippines. So I call this infantile Maoists and, you know, uh, they they make use of the name of Gonzalo, and yet they do not make a critical analysis why the People's War um, in uh, Peru has been has gone into decline because of the mistakes of Gonzalo. He was ultra left. He did not care about United Front in a big way. The way the Philippine uh, Communist Party. Uh, deals uh, seriously with the broad spectrum of the United Front. And when he was captured in 1992, he was begging for peace negotiations. And, you know, a leader like Aguinaldo, uh, when he is in the hands of the enemy, he cannot be the negotiator because he is under duress in the hands of the enemy. So what the enemy does in uh, Peru is just to keep... Uh, uh, this beggar for peace negotiations, uh, who is in prison, uh, you know, hanging all the time. And he has been in prison for um, uh, for so long, despite the changes, political changes outside of prison. Fujimori so was already overthrown, but uh, no United Front could help Gonzalo get out of prison the way I got out of prison, of the Marcos prison, uh, after seven years of imprisonment. So, um, at the same time, you have the persistent, uh, aside from uh, the old, what I call the infantile Maoists, there are the Trotskyites, you know? Uh, they are also ultra-left. As a matter of fact, they are the earlier type of ultra-left. Uh, this is the ultra-leftism. Oh, uh, the People's Democratic Revolution in the Philippines, so-called, is uh, uh, subservient. It's an inst is subservient to the national bourgeoisie. It is, uh, um, it is an instrument of the national bourgeoisie. Um, so <laughs> they, they don't, they don't uh, study the reality in the documents of the Communist Party of the Philippines. And then they say, ah, uh, People's Democratic Revolution, uh, that is nonsense, that is um, make asking for simply uh, national uh, uh, bourgeois democratic bourgeois revolution in the in the old way eh? uh, they don't see it as a new way eh? then they say oh the issue is not people's democracy or national democratic revolution but socialism but uh, in the same breath they say socialism in one country is wrong, is not possible. So uh, they're crazy. Therefore, making socialism as the main issue in the Philippines, but at the same time, they say it's impossible, uh, just like the way they, they consider Stalin wrong, uh, supposedly wrong, for um, establishing uh, socialism in the Soviet Union, uh, as uh, also Lenin agreed with. And uh, it, it has been a fact that for uh, several decades, socialism uh, developed in the Soviet Union and made the Soviet Union a powerful country until modern revisionism uh, undermined and um, uh, socialism in the Soviet Union and made the Soviet Union collapse in 1991. So uh, you have all these uh, 
um, ultra leftist coming up to in fact assist the right as Lenin uh, said against Trotsky now here comes now here is this Trotsky again uh, all speaking for himself and he pretends he poses as left only to help the right no uh, so you know you have this Trotskyites and this infantile Maoists attacking the Communist Party and they try to make themselves effective by attacking um, Mm, yeah. Duterte at the same time, so the, the sugar coat the attack on the uh, on the CPP by attacking Duterte. So they attack too. too. Uh, the the main contenders now in the Philippine uh, political scene uh, would be the Duterte, are the Duterte uh, fascist regime and the revolutionary movement led by the CPP and this ultra leftist at, uh, attack both sides and um, they claim. Uh, to represent uh, the uh, the ones holding the truth and the correct line, uh, but they, they have no place in the Philippine um, revolutionary struggle. I see. All right, Tito, to our audience, unfortunately, we, we are now closing our floors for questions. We are now down to our last question. Tito, our last question for me is, do you have any advice on activists how to avoid dogmatic or empiricist tendencies? To avoid dogmatism, don't just depend on uh, webinars like this or book reading. Um, you have to... Uh, it is important to read books and to have uh, study meetings like this, but it is important for you to make concrete social investigation and uh, have some and, and develop relations with the masses you want to arouse, organize, and mobilize. And um, um, do not think that uh, all truths, all ideas are already uh, in your hands at a given point in time. Or it's worse when you just depend on books and study meetings. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the activist, uh, guided by dialectical materialism, uh, continuously studies. Um, he does not is not satisfied with uh, you know fun, with, with uh, uh, jargon with those uh, terms um, that have meaning. Um, on a con with a concrete basis, because uh, such terms um, uh, can um, uh, gain more validity only by con by by continuous study and practical uh, activity. And um, um, uh, the problem with dogmatism is, you know, you think too high above the situation in such a way that you cannot. Uh, uh, get your feet on the ground and be with the people in moving forward uh, in the revolutionary struggle. Now, um, uh, you avoid uh, empiricism by studying theory. You must have some guidance. And theory will provide you the direction. Um, because if you just rely on, uh, the, uh, you know, on your own personal experience, uh, that kind of knowledge you get from first from your own senses and personal experiences, as I have said, limited, narrow, and short-sighted. You have to have the guidance of theory and the direction uh, set by uh, theory, which is uh, which is based anyway on accomplished uh, revolutionary struggles, and. Um, uh, without, uh, as in the time of Marx and Engels, even without experience, much experience in revolutionary uh, struggle, there is the experience and um, there's knowledge about the proletariat growing from its primitive beginnings in the development of capitalism uh, to, you know, the time when the, um, uh, the Communist Manifesto would be written on the basis of the um, of the big uh, growth of the proletariat in the Industrial Revolution, and then the uh, the uh, uh, emergence of the 1848 revolutions all over Europe, and of course 1871 Paris Commune. So, um, um, a uh, uh, when you are engaged in a revolution. Um, you do not just depend 
own, and they accumulated received knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. in the books. Uh, um, but, uh, and uh, you don't also uh, satisfy yourself with, you know, the writings that come from successful revolutions. You have to have your own way, according to the concrete circumstances in, in the country where you are fighting, waging revolution. There is no substitute for concrete analysis uh, of concrete conditions, but at the same time, you have to avail of theory. So, uh, by avoiding these two subjectivist errors, dogmatism and empiricism, you put yourself on the correct track. You have the proper relationship between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much again, Tito, no, for teaching us today, for having uh, us today in this Mao serie on practice and contradiction. Also, where do correct ideas come from? Um, unfortunately, um, our sessions is now closed. But before we um, we finally conclude the episode, we would just like to read a statement from the International League of People's Struggle for an urgent appeal for the immediate release of Amanda Echanis and her one-month-old baby, Randall Emanuel. We appeal for your urgent support to join the call for Amanda Echanis with her month-old baby Randall Emanuel's immediate and unconditional release on humanitarian grounds. On December 2 at around 3.30 in the morning, Amanda Socorro Lacaba Echanis, 32 years old, an organizer of peasant women under the Amihan National Federation of Peasant Women Cagayan Provincial Chapter, was illegally arrested and detained, along with her month-old baby, boy Randall Emanuel by the combined forces of the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police in Bangao Town, Cagayan Province. Amanda was charged with non-bailable trumped-up charges such as illegal possessions of firearms and ammunition and illegal possessions of explosives. Same with charges filed against peasant women who are currently incarcerated. The police reported seizing an M16 assault rifle one long plastic magazine for M16 rifle, one long steel magazine for M16 rifle, 20 live ammunition for an M16 rifle, and two hand grenades. The very evidence the police are claiming for her guilt is also the very evidence for the innocent of a frail mother with a delicate month-old infant. Moreover, amid her small build, the police are claiming she is high-ranking official of the New People's Army in the province. The mother and child are currently detained at Camp Adoru CIDG Region 2 headquarters in Togigarao City. Moreover, Amanda Chinese and her month-old baby are the latest to the increasing list of Duterte's accomplishment to silence critics. According to the Kulisang, Kilusang Mambubukid ng Pilipinas Regional Chapter Dangayan, Cagayan Valley since 2018, Massive and systematic red tagging of activists was rampant in the region of A by the AFP using fake organizations like Mulat CV and ISEM CV. They branded and accused the 57 names of activists as recruiters of the New People's Army or the NPA. Rip sacks written with names and organizations of activists were hanged on trees along major highways in the three towns of Isabela and Cagayan. Respectively, and Tugigarao City. Moreover, flyers were distributed in Tugigarao City, slandering the activists as terrorists and recruiters of NPA. Youngest political prisoners and a mother. Amanda is a daughter of Erlinda, Kalinda, Lakaba, and the assassinated Anakpawis Party List National Chairperson and Peace Consultant Randal Karandi Echanes in August. Uh, in August. In August 1990, Amanda, then barely one year and ten months, was the youngest political prisoner together with her parents who were incarcerated at the time on Trump-up charges. The Chinese family is a generation of activists and patriots who championed the cause of the people and the oppressed. For the second time, and now was a, now a first-time mother to her month-old baby, Randall Emanuel, Amanda was once again incarcerated on fabricated cases. Amanda's captors claims that while she was still recuperating from giving birth and taking care of her child, she was staying in a house with high-powered firearms and even grenades. It is total nonsense that while Amanda is breastfeeding and still recovering, she has guns and grenades 
hidden to defend herself. This is an old tactic and modus of the Duterte regime for the political persecution of activists. Once again, jail is not safe for Amanda and her baby. The mother and child should not be separated. Authorities should not violate the Republic Act 11148 or the Kulsugan at Nutrition na Magnanay Act that stresses the importance of the first 1,000 days of life refers to the period of a child's life, which is considered to be a critical window of opportunity to promote health and development and prevent malnutrition and its long life consequences. As activist and peasant woman organizer, when Amanda went to Cagayan province, she became an organizer of Anakpawis party list in 2016 up until 2019, and later became peasant woman organizer under Amihan Cagayan. From the very start, she was involving in helping the farmers peasant on women on their camps for land rights, lowering land rent, accessing benefits from the tobacco excise tax, gender equality, right to organize, and right to access social services such as relief aid during natural calamities. Before working full-time as a community organizer, she was a graduate of the Reward Philippine High School for the Arts, a former University of the Philippines student, and was a researcher for a local national non-government organization catering to the urban poor in the national capital region. Amanda is a soft-spoken, committed, well-loved friend and activist who become an inspiration to many young women and youth who selflessly, selflessly serve the people, peasant, women in Cagayan. Before her arrest, she was involved in the Campagna Contra Gutom as a collective action against hunger and poverty. Amid the pandemic and Duterte's military, stick, metal, metal, mil, militarist measures, Moreover, it was a campaign against the detriment impact of the RA-11203 rice liberalization law. The recurring drought and this recent months, the exacerbation of the impact of successive typhoons such as Typhoon Ulysses. And as a writer and cultural worker, coming from a family of writers, Amanda has already published books such as Tatlong Paslit na Alaala and was the playwright for the Nanay Maming Isang Dula depicting the life and struggle of the urban poor leader Carmen Nanay Maming de Unida for the right to shelter and an adequate standard of living and democratic rights. Recommended actions, we call on local and international human rights bodies, democratic institutions, civil libertarians, and concerned individuals to denounce the illegal arrest and detention and filing of trumped-up charges against Amanda Echanis and to help exert pressure on Duterte's government to demand their immediate and unconditional release. We urgently call on all supporters of the Free Amanda Echanis Network to lead solidarity actions and issue statements, send letters, emails, and or fax messages demanding the release of Amanda and her one-month-old baby on humanitarian grounds and the dropping of the trumped-up charges. Send support statements and posts on social media, either on your timelines or addressed directly to authorities. Also reinforce the demand to put an end to state harassment of activists, land reform activists, uh, advocates, and defenders of human rights. Let us demand the Philippine government under President Rodrigo Duterte to stop the red tagging, planting of evidence, and filing of fabricated non bailable criminal charges on activist and peasant woman organizers. Thank you so much for your support and solidarity. Let us reverberate this calls, Free Amanda Echanis with Baby Randall Emanuel, and use hashtag Free Amanda Echanis, Free Baby Randall, activism is not a cry, and stop the attacks against right defenders and activists. That letter is, for, is from um, the International League of People's Struggles, and we hope you can join us in advancing the campaign to free all political prisoners as well as um, um, Amanda Echanis. And po nagtatapos ang ating dis discussion in regards to on practice and contradictions and where do, contra uh, where do correct ideas come from? From uh, ideas from the late Ma uh, Chairman Mao Zedong. No? Stand by po tayo next week for our next discussion which is uh, um, on contradiction uh, on the correct handling of contradictions among the people. Yan po ang ating tatalakayin. Next week, dito lang, Andy Line Online, same time, same place. 
uh, make sure to note this on your calendars and catch, uh, catch up dates on our Facebook group and D-Line Online. Huwag kalimutan mag-like, mag-share at mag-imbita upang sumali sa ating makabuluhan at nakamumulat na talakayan dito lang sa National Democratic Online School Series with Tito Jo. Tito Jo, before we close, mayroon po ba kayong gustong sabihin uh, before we um, end the uh, episode? Nice kong magpasalamat sa lahat ng ating uh, tagapakanig uh, sa uh, mahalaga na uh, lumalahok sila sa ating uh, mga serye ng pag-aaral uh, nang sa gayon makak makakuha sila ng aral uh, para sa mas mabisang pagkilos nila para sa uh, pagtatanggol sa karapatan ng uh, mga mamamayan lalo na mga anak pawis at uh, uh, para isulong ang uh, pakikibaka para mapalaya ang ating bayan mula sa dominasyon ng imperialismo at uh, pagkahari uh, ng mga mapagsamantalang uri. Thank you so much. Again, Tito, maraming salamat po sa um, pagturo sa amin at pakikisa dito sa ND Line Online. Sa ating audience, maraming salamat po sa pakikibahagi muli. Ako po si Kasamang Christ, kasama si Tito Jo, mapagpalayang uh, hapon po para sa ating lahat. Pagwawasto, magdaluyong Narito ako Para ang kalat na lahat Na pulo Magiging muon Na buo Pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong Narito tayo, para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muon na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban Pagumpay sa ating bayan sa daibigan paglaya ng sangkatauhan narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa pagsulong narito tayo para sa masangating Pilipino narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo magiging muong Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa, pagsulong Narito tayo para sa masang aping Pilipino Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulong Magiging muong na buong Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proleta